So we have gone through all the characteristics of technology architecture in the previous videos. And that's the first stage of what a technology architect does. The second stage is going through decision criteria for choosing a particular architecture. So we have seen the characteristics that you would want ideally in an architecture and then you would pick up, cherry pick uh, the ones that you need. Okay, And then you can think of which ones to compromise or which ones to accentuate or give more importance over. And then you want to go through these decision criteria for choosing a particular architecture. How do you do that? Uh, and which ones are these? So firstly is domain. Now, uh, a technology architect must have great understanding of the domain under design. In a sense, a technology architect for um, for a head med tech or health tech platform, uh, a technology architect for a fintech platform, and a technology architect for an edtech platform, they would have very different skill sets, or uh, they would have very different knowledge at least, because they've had different type of experience, different type of technologies have been used, and now they have more experience in that particular domain, and they have a lot more information about that domain. Okay, so they would have understanding about what the, what the type of technologies that are used in that domain more. Or uh, like, let's say, because fintech is requires a lot more legal and privacy concerns. And so a technology architect would be a lot more um, sensitive to those requirements, right? So that's why domain is very important. Data architecture. So for this, um, a, a very basic architecture can be had, can be created by the technology architect, but he needs to work uh, in tandem or collaborate with the with a, a dedicated tech, uh, database architect to be able to figure this part out, okay? Organizational factors. Now, these are really important for choosing. So these are decision criteria for choosing a particular architecture, right? So like I said, for data architecture, uh, you'll have to collaborate with DBA, but you, you would eventually want to uh, leave the decision of the database in, in the hands of the DBA, right? You want, to, you want him to come up with the solution in a sense. Does he want to use um, like a NoSQL database or does he want to use an SQL database or does he want to use a different database for every single microservice, depending on whatever he says is the right way to go. And uh, organizational factors are basically factors like uh, ex existing vendors and pricing. So what does this mean? This means basically that in your company, you might have a relationship with vendors, like let's say in AWS or uh, GCP or Heroku or uh, any any other like, uh, you know, Linode or somebody like that who would be ready to provide you better rates uh, for uh, the cloud. Uh, and this could be an, not just related or not just restricted to cloud platforms, but any other type of technology. Like maybe you have a relationship with Twilio or, uh, you know, Exotel. So for different APIs and different technologies, you have different vendors. So that ways you, uh, that becomes basically your decision criteria because you now know that you're getting a better rate somewhere and you would get more support from some tech, uh, some company. So why would you not choose that company, right? So that's a big, so that's why I've put this in bold. Uh, it's a big decision criteria. Then you have domain architecture isomorphism. So this is again, like I mentioned for domain, it's the same thing. It's basically that some, uh, for some uh, domains, uh, some technologies are more preferred. So for example, we learn about, we will learn about microkernel architecture. Don't worry about that. But it, I'm just saying here that microkernel, for example, is really good for softwares that require a lot of customizability. Okay, space-based architecture is really good for discrete operations like genome analysis. And microservices are is really good architecture for highly scalable apps, right? So, uh, so based on the domain, uh, there's a particular type of architecture that works really well. So that's also a decision criteria, right? So you won't have to go through the entire exercise when you know that for health tech of this type of a platform, this is usually considered as a great architecture. Then you have monolith versus distributed. So do you want to, uh, are you in a POC or MVP phase? Do you want to stay like a monolith right now? Or do you want to go distributed because you are you have a product market fit and you want to now scale up really fast? That's also a decision. Then you have data flow. Understanding how the data is going to store, going to be stored or how it's going to flow throughout your system. That's a big decision criteria, right? For, uh, for a particular architecture. Uh, now, do you want to go synchronous or asynchronous? So I'll give you an example. Synchronous is convenient, right? But it can lead to scalability and reliability issues. So you, we've all heard about why asynchronous is really ruling the world right now, right? You've heard about uh, using queues, using message queues and streams uh, and streaming platforms. And you've heard about uh, event-driven architecture. So all of that comes from asynchronous and people really like it a lot. Uh, and we'll, we'll be going into a lot of depth with asynchronous architecture because that's also my favorite. I really like event-driven architectures. Uh, but synchronous has its own place, right? It's very convenient. It's very convenient and I would recommend uh, to not have 
uh, event-driven architectures, if you're building a very small product, do not even think about doing it. Just go for a very simple architecture. And um, that's why it says synchronous is convenient, but it can lead to scalability and reliability issues. Whereas asynchronous has like obviously, uh, you know, a lot of performance and it also has a lot of scale, but there are some challenges. So challenges include that you have synchronization of data because everything is asynchronously getting done. You have deadlocks, you have race conditions. I'll explain all of these to you, not a problem. Um, these I've, I've kind of covered in some of my Golang videos because uh, with Go routines, you, you do face these issues as, as well, uh, you know, deadlocks and race conditions. But we can discuss that here in itself uh, as well in the technology architecture videos. Uh, then you have some miscellaneous criteria. So one is internal processes. In a sense, if you are working in a company and you know the internal processes are built in a particular way and only this type of an architecture is going to work. So I'll give you an example. Some companies like to uh, have just the technology architect handling the, the 360 degree of the, of the architecture and they expect uh, the architect to just divide very small tasks and uh, divide these into uh, like assign them to different developers. So the developers really don't know what, what the entire platform looks like or the developers don't have the access to the entire platform or the code. Only the technology architect will have that. And he's just, uh, you know, giving everybody, assigning everybody these small tasks. So for these type of uh, companies, microservices is usually the way that they follow because they think that, you know, one microservice can be assigned to one developer and then the technology architect is responsible for connecting all these microservices and assembling the, the entire application and then uh, taking it live uh, or whatever, right? So you have to be aware of, uh, you know, what your internal processes uh, support more what your team is like. So if your team is not very comfortable working with or with very distributed architecture, the very young team, you can't go for something very advanced, right? You'll have to go for something really basic. Then operational concerns. Um, so uh, what technology architect, uh, you know, we end up thinking is we just think that it's only about the technology, but it's not. It's also about how the team is going to scale, how the team is going to collaborate and operate amongst each other, because that's where about 80% of the problems are uh, seen. They're seen when people start working with people, right? When people have to work with people, uh, they start having collaboration issues, they start having operational issues. So that operational concerns have to be taken into consideration before you think of uh, a final uh, technology architecture, okay? So uh, if if you don't know all of this, like, so I, what I'm telling you right now is a lot of a lot of deep information, right? If you don't know all of this and if you're given a problem, a technology architecture problem, you'll just go ahead and design something that you have heard is the latest technology in the market and you'll just come up with an architecture. But, uh, but when you have this kind of a layered understanding, when you have deep understanding of uh, how teams work together, how internal processes work together, how the technologies work together, how, how to make this, how to take this decision, then you're able to understand the pros and cons of every single technology, pros and cons of, you know, which one to choose where, what to do, uh, you know, at, at which stage. And as part of this series, we'll also dig down deeper into every single uh, technology in the sense, we'll compare different technologies with different technology and, and understand which one is suited for uh, which purpose. So in case you want to, in case you're interested in that, you can leave a comment uh, there, uh, below that you want, would like to, me to cover that. Or if you want me to skip that, then you can also write that in the comments below if you want me to skip that, all right? Uh, so thanks a lot for watching. Do subscribe to this channel if you're liking it. And I'll see you in the next video.